All right, thanks everybody for being here, and thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, just a short um, personal story before I start. Um, I, I got into computer science like in the 90s, and I, I kind of missed the boat on crypto anarchy when I was a kid. I just read about it on Wired or in Wired and you know about cypherpunks, but I was never involved. And when I got really into it, like in the in the early 2000s or later 2000s, um, when I met Smuggler and when I was reading Paul Rosenberg, it seemed to me that you know crypto anarchy was totally dead, and um, it was just a bunch of old dudes and um, some writings. And, um, and I really want to thank uh, Pavel and the whole team of HCCP for reviving this movement. You know, we really. I really never thought this something like this would be possible, you know? So thanks a lot, guys. So I'm going to talk about humanizing te dehumanizing technology today. And I will give you a short introduction about what it actually means, uh, a bit of history, or a, a view on history, and then two sides of it, the, the technical aspects and the human aspects, and why these developments, in my opinion, lead to uh, dehumanization, and why I think it's, it's time that we break the denial and then I will conclude. So I think the current mantra of the tech echo chamber is that technology is good, more technology is better, and smart contracts are best. That's why I have two mics. One is not enough. And um, I want to question that constructivism. I think it's a you know, technological constructivism that is harmful. In my view, I came to that view being you know, a tech guy myself. And maybe I'm just getting old, you know, that's the other, other explanation. And I can only describe the problem. You know, I don't want to say I have a solution. Uh, I just want to, you know, basically describe the problem as I see it. And maybe we can find a solution together. Um, yeah, I was already introduced. You know, I'm a software developer, IT security consultant. I'm mostly interested in secure messaging and digital currencies, you know, block blockchains where they make sense. And my approach was, or, or is still is, how can we use technologies to build a freer world? And I'm also a privacy extremist, which means I, I believe in the value of privacy for your personal liberty, and that's why I run around with a mask. And um, but I became somewhat disillusioned with mainstream technology, which is this, what is this talk is about. And first, so let's first have some definitions. So dehumanization is the act, or like it's a process or behavior that undermines the individuality of, of humans. And I really like individuality. That's why I'm a libertarian, crypto anarchist. That's why I believe in you know, these, these ideals. And that's why I strongly oppose, you know, all collectivist ideologies where, where I first have to be taught how to behave correctly. I think it's good if people can figure that out for themselves. And if they, uh, if they can also be different kinds of people without killing each other, coexisting. And in my view, dehumanization is the, the process that prevents that. And technology, is yeah, a collection of techniques, skills, and methods uh, which are used to produce goods and services and which are embedded in machines. You know, that's what we all have around us. Um, computers, smartphones, all these things. But uh, it's also important to look at technology in the sense of technique. So that means the process side. One example is um, Git and GitHub. Git itself is a software product. GitHub is a software product. It's a website. But these, that's not all of it. These uh, two um, tools, they also have processors that come along with it. You know, with Git, you know, pro some of you are software developers, I assume. So you know, you know how the Linux kernel does it on the mailing list. And for GitHub, you know, there are these processes of you send a pull request and you have you open an issue. And that, that's a very important part, I think, of, of technology or as Elul calls it, technique. And that's what I mean in, in this talk. So technology or technique in the, in the broad sense. And when I talk about, you know, if you combine those two terms about dehumanizing technology, it has a kind of a double meaning. Primarily, primarily I mean um, 
dehumanizing of humans in general through technology. And on the other hand, I mean uh, the dehumanizing of technology. That means we take the human element out of the technology. I focus on the first part, but the second part is important because it drives the first. Two um, examples from contemporary, contemporary culture, or older culture actually at this point. Um, this is Charlie Chaplin in uh, Modern Times, and it shows the first um, the first part of dehumanization, the man becomes the cock and the machine. And this is um, HAL 9000 from Space Odyssey, where the computer takes over and man has to fight against the computer because humans have been removed from the computer. And uh, so how do we get in, in a situation that I have to talk about such a topic? And uh, I think when we look at history, we can look at history from you know different angles and uh, yeah, different things that drive history. You know, you could look at history as driven by people. For example, you know Hitler, May, Merkel, Trump, Jong Un, people driving history. You can hi look at history as a as an accumulation of ideas driving um, driving it. Uh, in this case, like uh, fascism, capitalism, democracy, communism. You can also look at it as events. Let's say the, the Berlin Wall falls down or there's some natural disaster and this drives history. And they pretty much you know, all have their role, I think. But there's also technology, and I think it's sometimes a bit undervalued how much technology um, pushes history. And um, for example, there are certain developments which were very uh, important for knowledge transfer, like writing, then the printing press, the World Wide Web, then communications, you know, radio, TV, social media, weapons, gunpowder, atomic bombs, drones. And in my opinion, it, technology is a major factor in what drives um, history, if not the one dr driving factor. Uh, and I think it's, it's part of being human that we uh, think that we actually matter more than we do. And um, just uh, two examples of technology driving history. This is the uh, Volksempfänger or the people's receiver that was, was used by Goebbels to, uh, for prop propaganda purposes. And, and I think actually having that technology was a major driving factor. And now these days it's uh, Trump who was really good at um, using Twitter good, but uh, so I think, the, of course, the people are important, but the technology was there, and some people then can use that technology very efficiently and, and have an effect. And um, another example, I think that Bitcoin was a very important piece of technology, the, the, the missing piece that kicked off the blockchain craze. And it is interesting, in my opinion, to see that um, there was this huge fascination with who is Satoshi Nakamoto. And I think the reason is that, like I said earlier, we, we think we, we want to matter more than we actually are. So that, that's why it's like we want to see this guy or woman or group or whatever and who, who made this. And that's, I think, which is one of the reasons why um, he was so, uh, why the quest is so big. And I think that's also, the reason why we think that, or many think, that Craig Wright cannot be the guy. Because at that point, it was like this, you know, benevolent genius who must be like godlike and perfect. And then the guy, I don't want to comment, you know, on if I think it is, it is him or not. But I think a big reason why many people think he's not the guy is he doesn't fit the picture. You know, he's not really like the most social person on the planet. And... And I think this also explains these things like uh, Steve Jobs and Elon Musk, for example, like recent, recent uh, examples, where how they're idealized. You know, it's like the focus on one person. And of course, it's never the one person, but we, we like to believe, you know, we want to believe. And um, like I said, so technology is, is 
in my opinion, a very dri um, important driving factor, and there are certain you know, properties of, of technology that are very important in the process that leads to dehumanization. And one of them is uh, past dependencies. What that means is we build some technology, and given that set of technology we already have, it's more likely that we build something based on top of that, because otherwise we would have to start from scratch. A modern example is um, web applications. You know, we started out with, before, I forget all the rest, you know, Unix and computers, but when we had the, when we had the t uh, internet, somebody invented HTTP and HTML and JavaScript to um, distribute documents. And then we try to rebuild applications on top of that, which, as you probably know, is not the greatest idea, but that the reason we do that is uh, past dependencies. And that's the reason why countless young lives are wasted, trying to understand Node.js. Um, another thing um, you see in technology is that the tech intervention spiral. You might know the, the intervention spiral described in, in Austrian economics. You know, you have a free market, and then a state makes an intervention, and it has some unintended consequences, and it leads to a new intervention, and so on and so forth. And I think technology is a bit like that. You know, we always, as technology people, we always go for the technological fix. And uh, same process. You know, a technology creates a solution, which is fixed with technology, which creates another so uh, problem, and so on. Give you an example. Um, so we had horse carriages to get around, then everything was full of shit, literally. And fast forward a few hundred years, Industrial Revolution, we get cars. They were great. Then we get more cars. Then we need to get you know, special streets, like the Autobahn, controlled access highways, and we get pedestrian traffic lights. And that is a great example of dehumanization, because at that point, man had to subordinate to the mas machine. You have to wait when there's a red light, you cannot go to certain streets. And then we get even more cars, and then we have traffic jams, pollutions, parking space problems. And then we try to solve that with electric cars, Uber, and self-driving cars. And you forward that trend for around 10 years, and you have tons of critical infrastructure that is machine-controlled and online. And that leads to the next thing, which is cascading failures. It seems to me we're building a lot, many systems which uh, can lead to cascading failures. And cascading failures is a failure in a system of interconnected parts in, in which one failure can lead to the next failure, and then maybe even the whole thing crumbling. You know, it's also known as systems failure. This is a recent example from Puerto Rico, where you had the uh, a natural disaster, then the electricity doesn't work, and now people, uh, the ATMs do not re really work, and then people run out of cash. And that's a huge problem already. If you think about the same situation with everybody tries to pay with smartphones, then you have no cash anymore. And, and it means we, we're building more and more connected systems, and a lot of these applications at a later stage, they become uh, not just business critical, they become security critical, and then when the Internet of Things, where we basically connect everything, they become safety critical. Safety critical means human lives can be uh, harmed when something goes wrong. And that means like one system failure can lead to catastrophe. And there's another aspect to that, which, uh, which basically John Robb described in his book, um, Brave New War. That is, uh, when, you, when you have such a system, you, you have this situation of asymmetric warfare, warfare that you know, terrorists can attack these critical components and rock, um, make big impact on, on such societies. In a way, I think they, they didn't really understand it yet, but as soon as they do, uh, that's a huge problem. Because like one person can really uh, affect uh, technological societies in a big way. And um, another technological problem we're seeing is artificial intelligence or artificial general intelligence. So artificial intelligence is means apparently intelligent behavior by machines. And we're already very good at that. You all know that there are some tools you're using they are better than you can ever be. That's why we rely on them too much. We don't do any, we, you know, we use online map services. I'm pretty sure nobody from you is able to beat a modern chess, uh, chess engine. And, but that's still, you know, in a 
special field and pretty dumb. Artificial general intelligence means that a, a, a um, computer program or a, like some system can pretty much uh, perform all operations a human can do. So it has uh, the intelligence of a human being, and it means it could potentially outperform humans in any domain. And this is like, um, this leads to two very dangerous scenarios. One of them is that a po very powerful AI or an AGI with human master, like some technic technological elite group, um, takes over and it leads to technological totalitarianism, or you have an AGI without a human master, and that leads basically to the singularity, and uh, which means you know once you have that, that system can improve itself, and in a very short time, it's at a point where it's like as intelligent, we are as intelligent to it as like ants are intelligent to us, and that's pretty much game over for, for humans. And um, now coming to the human aspect, so, when we are, um, we always say, yeah, especially as tech people, you don't have to use this. Like, oh yeah, when I when I talk about, you know, smartphones are like a privacy nightmare, everybody tells me, okay, but you don't have to use it. The question is, how much choice do you really have? Looking at smartphones, you know, 2007, 4% of all American adults had a smartphone, 2017, it's 77% and 92% of those under the age of 35. And in South Korea, under 35, 100% market penetration. Everybody has a smartphone. That means if you don't use a smartphone, you're pretty much opting out of normal society. And um, as, a, as an interesting uh, anecdote, myopia rate for 20-year-olds in South Korea uh, increased to 96%. I don't know if it's connected, but it's very interesting that it grew that fast. And this is another example, past dependency. You know, everybody's using a smartphone. You, you have to kind of build on smartphones in order to do anything. And also a great potential for cascading failures. Once you build them in into other systems, they become safety critical, and then it's a huge problem. For example, in China, um, uh, they have two systems, WeChat and Alipay. They kind of took over payments and cash is third, everybody's using them. Of course, they're not very privacy aware, they're connected to a bank account, and it's really hard to do any business in China or you know, just normal life without these apps. I know of uh, somebody who told me the story that he basically tried for two days to get a bank account in China just so he can use these apps because it, would, it was worth it to, you know, life becomes simpler if, if you have these apps. And, uh, so we, we, we're deploying these new technologies in a, in, a, in a very large rate, and, and it has some side effects. You know, for example, um, smartphones are linked to depression. You know, young young teens they have an increased depression. Um, suicide rates go up. Um, And there is no, you know, it's like we, we just deploy it. It's not like medicine. We just we just deploy these new technologies. Another thing with the internet, there's this book a few years ago. I started reading the the shallows, what the internet is doing to our brains. Then I got distracted, and uh, it took me like a year or so until um, until I was able to read it again. And um, so it, it shows that. The, you know, the net is a, it explains like the, the net is a very powerful tool, but also gives you these dopamine hits. You know, like you all know that from Twitter, Facebook, whatever, you post something and then, oh, you get a like. So we kind of get into this uh, mode of consuming these short pieces of information and we kind of losing, um, we kind of losing the ability to digest long, long pieces of text which was a huge cultural achievement. You know, we, we kind of learned, we, we're not built for long sustained periods of concentration because we're built for a world where there's an imminent attack. So we're very easily distracted and the uh, book as a, as a good, as a technology allowed us to practice that. And we're kind of losing that and it's the same, same situation. We, we don't really um, know the consequences yet. And, um, Addictive system. So, prediction from Arto: uh, When VR porn hits the mainstream, it will be one of the largest evolutionary se selection events in human history. I I totally agree with that assessment. Um, 
just some unsolicited uh, investment advice. If you want a good investment, buy small apartments with fiber optic, internet, and Soylent on tap. It will be very in high demand. And it's just one example. We're already, we already building these addictive systems. You know, we, we do gamification of many things. We do A-B testing, machine learning. Like I said earlier, these dopamine hits you get through, you know, certain apps and certain uh, technologies on the internet. Pretty much all these uh, all these companies, especially the ones driven by uh, by advertisements, they they use all their you know huge pools of computer science people to imp make it more addictive. And uh, we're already there, you know, and it's gonna get much worse. And um, Alan Kay who is like the inventor of object-oriented programming, windowing uh, graphical user interfaces, and um, it's my favorite grumpy old guy from computer science. And he said, uh, television is the last technology we should be allowed to invent and put out with a, without a surgeon's general warning. That means like a, a warning that it can affect your health. And I find it I find it very interesting that um, we, for let's say medicine, the, the FDA approval is super expensive, takes forever, and um, it's often criticized it takes too long. But for technology, we just, we just apply it, you know, and uh, technology adoption is increasing, and, but hu we as humans, we fundamentally remain the same. And evolution works on a very long time scale, and um, and some of the problems are actually only occurring when you when you have really large doses. Like f for me, for example, I think the problems I could personally experience with um, let's say internet use it really took off once I had a smartphone and could check it all the time. You know, one, when I was still having a desktop and I was very early to the game. Um, is a different situation, but when you're like on it all the time, that's when you really mean, you realize like that, oh, I, I, I cannot finish this book. I always read like 10 pages at maximum, and then I want to Google something. And um, and we don't do any studies, you know, like YouTube Kids, uh, we talked about this on this conference before. Um, that's like, you, you basically put this super addictive technology in front of very young kids and, and feed it to them and nobody is, is thinking about it. And I'm not, I'm not, you know, it's not a, I'm not asking for regulation, I'm just putting it out there. It is a very interesting um, uh, scenario that we, that we don't, that we look at these things so differently. And, um, and that means we, I think we have, we have more unintended consequences faster. And we have entire generations growing up without knowing an alternative. I, s I think it's not, not just that we build tech, more tech, we also build it faster. That means a new generation suddenly you know, grows up the entire generation with smartphones. And they don't know anything else. And it will be, with all the next technology, it will be the same. And if there's a bad consequence, that's an entire generation on that, on that technology. And um, another... So that brings me to dehumanization. How, how we do we, you know, we build technology that dehumanizes us. And I think smart contracts are a really dumb idea. And the reason is that it's pretty much machine algorithms deciding over humans. And one example, there was this Irish woman, who, she wanted to get a permanent residency in Australia. And as part of the process, you have to do an oral test, like your, your speaking proficiency, and she failed it as a native speaker, which is, of course, completely ridiculous if you fail an English test as an English native speaker, but she couldn't resolve the problem, you know, because it's like the, the visa authority said it's, the test is, you know, it's binding. The company said, yeah, but the test, the computer is, it doesn't fail. So pretty much she's now on a temporary visa and has to practice her English to pass the test. And... Um, and another reason why I think this is like a really dumb idea is that we cannot know all special cases in advance. You know, if you're a programmer and you, you write a, a small function, I'm pretty sure you all had this experience that you later realized there was one special case you didn't take care of and that bites you. And then thinking of like we, 
we're not talking about small functions. We're talking about contracts where we want to, uh, you know, uh, put all special cases which not apply to a technical domain, but which apply to a human domain for the next however many years, you know, in code without any human being able to change that later. And um, there's this example, uh, the guy nobody knows, but we should all know, Stanislav Petrov, the man who single-handedly saved the world from nuclear war. And that guy, he was in, in Russia, and uh, he basically pretty much had the, his job was when the Americans attack with atomic missiles, he had to push the button. And then the machine said, they are attacking. And the guy didn't push the button because he was sure that it was a false alarm. And uh, so he pretty much saved humanity from uh, World War III. And uh, I think that's because he has a human element. You know, he had, had like this, he has some ethics, he has some feelings. A smart contract would have pushed that button because the sensor said the missiles are coming. And so we, we don't know, that's another, another aspect, we don't know how the world will develop. Um, I, I see Bitcoin as a great example for that. Because when, we, when I got into Bitcoin, you know, it was like the libertarian dream. We, we will have you know, this cryptocurrency, it will undermine the state and whatnot. And I think many, many people are, uh, in the field are in, the, in that position, like many people in the room. But now they realize that Bitcoin is going in a totally different direction. You know, suddenly it's about ICOs and uh, bankers trying to make a quick buck or, you know, central banks thinking maybe can, we can print the fiat on the blockchain. And, and all the people who are like early in there, like for ideological reasons, they're trying to, you know, push it back into that direction. But the genie is out of the bottle. And that's a very important thing in tech. You cannot control what happens to, a, to your uh, technology. For example, if you combine states with blockchains and smart contracts, you have efficient oppression. You know, we always like to say, yeah, the state is not efficient, but if we give them, you know, efficient technology, it will be much more efficient. For example, Accenture and Microsoft, um, they're teaming up to provide the blockchain-based digital ID network, which provides an ID, you know, to all these 1.1 billion people who don't have one. And they think it's a really great idea. And I, I, don't, I don't think it's a great idea, but it, it is a great example of how once the technology is out there, it will be used for purposes the people who actually put it out there might not like. And um, the, so in my opinion, smart contracts are dehumanizing technology. Another technology we have right now is, is democracy. And I'm wondering, maybe democracy has uh, reached end of life. Um, because also, like, if you look at history, you know, as this te technological um, succession and democracy was clearly better than communism, maybe not for moral reasons, but for efficiency reasons. And now we're seeing that democracy is not so efficient anymore. And suddenly you have all these, you know, topics like, uh, oh, there's hate speech and fake news. Uh, we, you know, it's propaganda, you know, and then we have to nudge people, we have to introduce social scores, that's what they're doing in, in, in China. We have also growing state dependence, we have people are pathologized, you know, suddenly you have all these, you know, mental disorders. And that might lead, lead to technological totalitarianism. And I think it's a bit dangerous that this situation where everybody's pretty much busy with consuming and red race and is generally uh, anxious. They don't really, they don't really see it. And um, so again, that's just for me an example how how technology um, is actually very powerful. And now we have this new situation where you have, you know, these very uh, influential social networks and data mining and all that, all these things. And now they threaten democracy. But in my opinion, people in power they don't want to. They're not interested in democracy. They're interested in staying in power. Um, and if you if you combine all that together, I think we have we kind of like an endangered species. species. And um, the reason is that I, I think we are pretty much already unable to understand the world we live in. And uh, I see that as a, I say that as a tech person, and I think it's a bit of hubris also for myself that I think I can understand technology. I can understand technology, but realistically, I can only understand a little bit. 
You know, I followed Bitcoin starting 2011, and I don't, I'm not able to follow everything anymore. You know, as soon as I do something else, I, I cannot read all the white papers, all the forks, and all the, you know, don't even get me started on IoT, uh, you know, um, ICOs. You know it. You know, there's so many white papers, it's impossible to follow. And we had it in science, you know, we had like uh, disciplines and sub sub disciplines and and it developed so fast that now you can only study very, very short, uh, very tiny niche. And uh, and what technology is doing, uh, what science did, technology is doing the same. So like I said, um, I, I suffer from like uh, technological bias and belief in technological constructivism. And that's what I realized recently, that um, I also like to, I like to think that, you know, oh, technology is the, is the solution, and if, if something doesn't fit my worldview, it cannot be true. For example, you know, climate change, if it exists and is man-made, if I'm honest, I have no clue, because I would have to study for years just on that area to know. But I wanted to believe it is not man-made. And if, if it is man-made, that's fine, because libertarianism. And if it is there, actually, we're just going to fix it with more technology. And then later I'm like, maybe it's not true. You know, Maybe it's really man-made and really fucked up, and we cannot solve it. I have no clue. And, uh, but I always thought, we, we're going to build a free world with technology. And I'm not so sure about it anymore. You know, I think it's, it's, very, it's a very um, problematic situation we're in. Um, like I said, just shortly, two examples, uh, the lack of power over your own creation. There was uh, Weizenbaum, uh, he was an IT professor at MIT, he was doing uh, artificial intelligence in the 60s, and he wrote this program, you, many of you probably know, where you can chat with, uh, um, with a therapist. And he wrote it as a joke, because he, said, he thought, okay, if I should provide that program, I show people how ridiculous it is to think that a, hu a computer can replace human in communication. And then later, his doctor, doctors wanted to, um, to use that program in, in practice. And the guy had like a crisis and wrote, uh, you know, became a technology critic, and uh, MIT probably regretted you know, giving him tenure, because it kind of sucks when you have a tenured computer science professor for artificial intelligence who doesn't want to program. And that's one example. Another one was Oppenheimer, Manhattan Project, you know, built the atomic bomb, and then later realized that uh, wasn't so great, and then lost the security co um, clearance for his outspokenness. And um, so I think it's time to end the denial, and I tried, you know, I had this face of, um, or I'm still in it, I think, like this personal crisis. What am I actually doing here? And I was reading a lot, and one of the things I found was Dark Mountain Manifesto. And these guys are actually environmentalists. If I sum it up a bit, uh, you know, not so cool. Uh, if I sum it up, it's basically the realization that we cannot reach, reach a sustainable world by drinking organic soy lattes. And um, so pretty much these guys, they were like, you know, we, we're not going to reach sustainability. We got, we're not going to save the world. The environment will collapse or the environment, we have an environmental crisis we cannot, we cannot solve. And how do we deal with that? I don't want to, I don't want to go into environmentalism, but I think the, the correlation is the same, you know. Uh, I, I'm not saying, you know, primitivism is a solution. I think there's no space to retreat to uh, anymore. So if you, if you try to opt out of technology, you will be overrun by people who, are, um, who have better tech. That's what historically always happened. And just a few motivations for, um, for technology. I think it's good if you, if you build something for survival. You know? That's why I'm in favor of, the, uh, of Elon Musk's SpaceX, SpaceX and you know, Mars, you know, building a sustainable civilization on Mars. I think that's a really smart idea. And I'm generally in favor of human development. I think if you, if you just build something for comfort, convenience, entertainment, addiction, or uh, domination and control, it's not a great idea. And I think it's not a morally good argument to say, if I don't build it, somebody else will. It's true. Probably somebody else will build it. But it still doesn't mean that you should do it. And um, as heuristics, 
I think it's important to ask yourself as a tech person, do I have to solve it? And does it introduce new failure modes? You know, uh, similar to the uh, solutions of the uh, environmentalists, I think also in tech it's good if we have solutions which have not like failure connections to other pieces. If we have local uh, technology which when it fails doesn't you know, lead to cascading failures. So to conclude, uh, my, my five core points are one, I think people in tech often suffer from technological biases and technological constructivism, at least I do. Uh, I think uh, second point, human, uh, humanity is building dehumanizing technology that may lead to technological totalitarianism, machines or elites deciding. Third point, tech is accelerating and we are not. So either tech becomes magical, we cannot understand it anymore, or we will stop being human. Four, uh, one should check one's own motivations for building tech and realize the limited influence over its effects. And fifth, we might already be beyond the point of no return uh, in regards to dehumanizing technology. That's where, you know, draw the parallel that we might have to just realize that that's the point. We're kind of fucked and we have to try to solve the, solve the problem based on that realization. Because we should never forget that uh, the human race with technology is like an al alcoholic with a barrel of wine. Um, so we are fucked. How do we deal with that in the future? Uh, some pointers, I think it's very important to learn from other camps. These are some of the things I found when I was reading on the subject. And like you could see with the movie pictures in the beginning, people have been thinking about that for a very long time from other fields. And I think it's very important to, to not ignore that. Not everything that is worthwhile reading is written in a blog post. Um, so I want to thank Smuggler and Arthur for many discussions on this. You can contact me on this email or Twitter, and I put the uh, slides on the internet. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for your interesting speech. We have uh, about six uh, minutes for Q&A. So. Um, don't you think that the cascading failures are unpredictable? Like you started with a horse carriage and it's very difficult to imagine that it will end with self-driving electric cars? Well, I, s I see that more as the te technology creates a new problem and not as so much as cascading failures. Uh, they, of course, they are unpredictable, but I think there are some you know, heuristics you can apply. The more connected things are, the, the more likely it is to, that it leads to cascading failures. I think that's why it's important to try to separate technologies and make sure that if one, one fails, uh, others um, survive. Um, yeah, one, one a bit uh, funny remark, but terrorists can actually be the, uh, the chaos monkeys of Western civilization because when they you know, randomly knock out critical infrastructure, you can test if it still works. So, uh, do, you, do you think that, um, that our way, a possible way out of this could be to start analyzing the, the not technology, not sociology, not the things separately, but as part of a, a bigger um, ecosystem where all things um, influence each other. Because I believe these this things of considering the, the technology the main force of evolution or the main force of destruction and also or ideas or persons, no, as, as you listed in the, the view on history, it's, 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 it's also um, biasing the whole way on, on doing an analysis on, on this. Because we are technology experts, we tend to uh, find the guilty of all the world going uh, to be becoming an, an hell on, on technology. And maybe a sociologist is thinking that the world is going bad because of bad sociology and so on. So in, in, be, what do what you think about this? I don't know. No, really, I, I, I explicitly try to not uh, think so much about the solution because the problem was so bad already. And uh, it's, it's great you start thinking about it. Uh, one remark, one question. Uh, the remark, um, you should look into how much history is made by ge geography and external events. Frequently, history of countries is rather predictable by their geography. 
Um, but the question is, um, so essentially you're making an argument for starting more tech spirals because they are farther away from failure mode. Is that true? <laughs> no. No, my, my, my core argument is I really don't have the solution. I, it, it, for me, it looks like, okay, we, we can't really go back to primitivism because that's, it's, it seems unrealistic to me. I mean, there are people who, you know, anarcho-primitivists, that's basically what they're saying. And so the solution of killing off like 99% of the human population and destroying all technology doesn't really seem like the mole one to me. And, and the other one is like, on, we seem to be, you know, building these very complex systems which threaten humanity. I don't, I don't know where we can find the solution in the middle. I really don't, but yeah. Hey, uh, just digging into technological constructivism, I know the uh, Russian constructivists were really engaged in foregrounding the materials that went into their structures, so like the steel beams. And I'm wondering, is there an analogy for digital technology that you can sort of reveal the materials that went into the constructions as a way of like ameliorating some of the problems? Mm. No, I, I, I don't know about that, no. Sorry. And do you think that decentralization of power uh, can make things worse, better, or, or doesn't matter? I think centralization of power definitely makes things worse. Yeah, so... I think that's a general, a general um, conclusion I have that, you know, distributing technology knowledge and power to smaller communities and smaller groups is, is a step in the right direction. I think that's where we can learn from environmentalists, for example, who, you know, do this grow local by local thing. I, I think that's uh, definitely a problem, yeah. Okay. Uh, in some part of the presentation, you said smart contracts could be a really, really bad idea. Uh, the way to enforce contracts now is by state enforcing the contracts. This is another alternative. But if this is a bad, bad idea, what could be a good alternative to enforce deals or negotiations between people? Well, I think we, we already have, we have these uh, solutions. You, uh, you can see it in international commerce that corporations usually, they, they use um, what are called arbiters. You know, they use privately owned or private persons, companies who will resolve conflicts later. So I think that's definitely a very good approach. Of course, you still you still have a have a rule of of uh, a book of rules like some law, but you you know privately agree on that. Um, but I think a good judge is somebody who can apply that with the fuzziness of of human interactions and the real world. And so I think that's definitely the way to go. And I'm not saying that you know all automatic things are bad, like a multi-sig. Transaction, of course, is also a smart contract, and I'm not saying that's that's bad, but at some point it becomes, I think, dangerous. Yeah. Okay, so we have time for the last question. I just wanted to ask if you actually uh, believe, sorry, that singularity has to necessarily be bad for humankind, because it's uh, to me, I think it's based on the notion that the artificial intelligence is going to decide that humans have to be dealt with in some way that isn't ideal for us, but what if the, uh, what if the AI actually decides that we are like the most precious thing in the universe? <laughs> um, let's, let's put it that way. I, I don't want to outrule that possibility. I think that's definitely in the realm of possibilities, but I wouldn't want to you know, bet the future of the human race on, on that outcome. Okay, thank you, Frank. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.